Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I'm really glad you're here today. The episode that you're going to hear is actually an interview that Sarah Bueno, (laughs) my words, (laughs) I was a guest on Sarah Bueno's podcast called Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Sarah was a guest on this podcast, episode 50, where we talk about boundaries. I love Sarah. I need to give you a warning. On Sarah's podcast, she swears, and as y'all know, I swear like a sailor, and if uh, swearing offends you, or you have children in the car, or people that you do not want to hear my potty mouth and Sarah's potty mouth, then do not listen to this episode. This episode makes me really happy because I did get to swear, and it's an amazing conversation. I've had many of you ask about what is my story, And I share bits and pieces with you, but what's really nice in this episode is Sarah asks a little bit more about what my story is. So if you're curious and you don't know very much about where I came from and how I got to where I am, we really talk about it in this episode. And it's just a lovely, meaty, laughter-filled, honest conversation. And I I really do. I I just really appreciate Sarah. I have to say as a follow-up, We talk about, oh, yeah, I think we talk about it in this episode, that when we had connected, it wasn't a good time for her to be friends, and that was fine. She was a guest on my podcast. I was interviewed by her in this episode. When it came out in November of 2020 this year, we had talked about connecting via Marco Polo, and I had totally forgotten that we had talked about it because we recorded during the summer. So I reached out to her via Marco Polo, and we have been having these really lovely conversations. And so sometimes when we get a no, it it may not be a no, it may be a not right now. Anyways, I think that what you're going to hear is just the whole episode, the way it came out on Sarah's podcast, and I will come on the end and do a little bit of an outro. I am not going to read Sarah's bio on this, but she is going to be a guest on the podcast coming up soon, or you may have already heard it. If you haven't taken the podcast survey or signed up for the newsletter, I would love to have you do that. You can go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com. There's a tab for the survey. And on the banner, there's a place where you can sign up and get the top most downloaded podcast episodes. The advantage of signing up for the newsletter is I let you know about special events that are coming up and where you can, uh, I think I'm going to be redundant. (laughs) Anyways, it keeps you up to date. And I would love to have you sign up if you don't want to, no problem. The podcast survey helps me get to know you, and it's all optional. If there's anything you don't want to answer, you don't have to. By the time you hear this, we should have our little store set up. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. And on my podcast page, there will be a tab that says shop the store or store something that will lead you to another website where you can buy merchandise that's for highly sensitive people. So now, on to the show. Hi there. Welcome to Conversations with the Wounded Healer. My name is Sarah Bueno, and if this is your first time listening, OMG, hi, thanks for coming by. (laughs) I am a psychotherapist in Chicago, and this podcast is all about deep conversations with other healing professionals about the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. And today's guest is somebody that I met on social media, you guys. I keep telling you to connect with me on social media, and only a few people take me up on it, but I'm serious about making friends on that. So just saying, just saying. One of my favorite places to connect with people is on Instagram. So if you want to find me there, it's at Head Heart Therapy. Now, let me tell you about Patricia. So Patricia Young is a licensed clinical social worker and coach. She knows what it's like to feel like an outcast, misfit, and truth teller. Learning about the trait of being a highly sensitive person, or HSP, that helped Patricia rewrite her history with a deeper understanding, appreciation, and a sense of self-compassion. 
She created the podcast Unapologetically Sensitive to help other HSPs know that they are not alone and that being an HSP has amazing gifts and some challenges. Patricia works online globally, working individually with people, and she teaches online courses for HSPs that focus on understanding what it means to be an HSP, self-care, self-compassion, boundaries, perfectionism, mindfulness, communication, and creating a lifestyle that honors us. That sounds nourishing as fuck, doesn't it? (laughs) Sorry for that, like, very strong reaction, but that just felt nourishing to my soul. So thank you for writing what a beautiful intro that is. (laughs) So please enjoy my conversation with Patricia. Hello, Patricia. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hey, Sarah. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you. And I just am so sorry it's taken me so long to get around to it. But hi, you're here. I'm here. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to start by uh, sharing with folks how we got connected? Sure. Well, I found your podcast and I think we're in a couple of Facebook groups and I reached out to you. We had a great talk and I wanted to be friends and you said you were busy. (laughs) Which is my life. Yeah. (laughs) But I appreciated that boundary that you set. I really, really appreciated that. And then I have a podcast called Unapologetically Sensitive, and you were on my podcast. I don't know. I'm so terrible with time. A while back ago. Who knows? (laughs) And we just had such a genuine, authentic communication. Mm -hmm. I think our styles are very similar in that we're really about being authentic and real and vulnerable and being in the messy middle. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. Yeah. So tell folks how you came to this place, right? You've you've got a longer journey than just I'm a podcaster. So start <laughs> wherever you like and tell people who you are and what you do. I was born. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you can start there. I'm like, yeah, let's dig into the childhood shit. Let's do it. Well, it, it is interesting. My mom left home when she was 16. She had a pretty abusive uh, relationship. And when she had me, she didn't stay with my birth dad. And then she remarried. My mom was very anxious. The rules had rules. And Mm. there were some very positive things that my mom was able to offer me growing up. And, you know, she was a single mother who was really anxious. My dad left when he was five. So I kind of made up this story about, you know, the reason why I'm so in tune with people's feelings and so sensitive and responsive is because it was for survival. Mm -hmm. And I was born an old soul. I wasn't, yeah. (laughs) I had this narrative even with my husband, like, he's the fun parent. (laughs) Oh, But anyways, I became a therapist and learned about the trait of high sensitivity, and it really just made sense to me. And I really went back and rewrote the narrative of my life. I knew I wanted to do a podcast about vulnerability. And when I learned about the trait of high sensitivity, it's like, this is it. So I launched my podcast, Unapologetically Sensitive. If you've been told you're too sensitive, you think too much, you worry too much, you can't take a joke, you're too dramatic, you're too intense you may be a highly sensitive person and it's something that's innate. It's how we're born. It's how we're wired. If we have a difficult childhood, like I did, research shows that you're more inclined to have higher incidence of of anxiety and depression, which I did. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, have a parent that's really in tune with you, then the outcomes are very great. Half of our clients in therapy are highly sensitive people because we want to learn, we want to grow. So the thing is that we do really well in positive environments. It's called differential susceptibility. So you put us in a positive environment and we're going to do better than the other 80%. You put us in a poor environment, a stressful environment, and we're going to do worse than Mm. the other 80%. It's it's estimated that about 20% of the population, I heard Dr. Aaron, she's the one that coined the trait highly sensitive person Mm. back in the 90s. It's also called differential No, sensory processing sensitivity Mm. is the other research-based term. Mm. And I think the thing is that being a highly sensitive person, we're deep thinkers. We feel things deeply. We notice things that other people don't. There are parts of our brains that are wired differently. We've got a finely tuned nervous system, but we often come up with solutions to problems that other people don't because we see so many aspects And the challenge that I have with the term is I think people think of somebody who just cries a lot and is emotional and there's so much more to Mm -hmm. it and we have so many strengths and our culture doesn't really value sensitivity. So we do have strong emotional responses to things. We have a lot of empathy. We're very caring. We care about social justice issues. We don't like, you know, watching violence or watching people or animals get hurt. But we also tend to be the healers, the change makers, the justice makers, because that sense of inequity just really rubs us the wrong Mm -hmm. way. 
when did you, I guess, notice for yourself that maybe you were responding in a, in a way that people were categorizing as sensitive? Like, when did it kind of stand out for you? I don't, I don't think, well, because of how I grew up, feelings were not okay. So if I had to mm-hmm. cry, I had to go to my room and my mom, you know, like I had a blackboard outside of my door. I love my mom. She lives with us. We've done repair work. So mm-hmm. I just want to be really clear, but I could write my feelings on my board, but it just was too overwhelming for her. So the way that mm-hmm. I learned to cope was by being incredibly intellectual And when I was 30, I moved into a recovery home for my eating disorder. And every morning we did a feelings check-in with like the seven Mm. words of angry, sad, lonely. Mm -hmm. I I couldn't even tell you what a feeling was. And Mm. I had a contract where I could only speak in one sentence because I'd use, I'd learned to use words as a way. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. And on Sundays we would get to have like a date with somebody from the community for two hours. So I, you know, like went on a on a date with somebody from the eating disorder community that I didn't know. And I could only talk in one sentence. Oh my God. So that was outside of groups and stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. yeah I had a lot wow. of contracts. <laughs> <laughs> because, because what I learned was to push people away with my words and that yeah. I was very self-sufficient, very independent. And my mom, and even in the house, people would come to me to have me solve problems because I was like really efficient, mm-hmm. a great problem solver, very efficient. So learning how to lean into the feelings and kind of the softer side has really been a process for me. Mm -hmm. I'm relating to so much of what you said. And I've only realized recently, because I'm a feeler and, you know, I've always felt my feelings. And so did we talk about the Enneagram when we talked before? I don't think so. Do you know what your number is? I think I know, but I'm not sure. So I don't want to say. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So I'm I'm a three in the Enneagram, and one mm-hmm. of the hallmarks of the three is is shutting down your feelings in mm-hmm. in order to like achieve. Right. And I used to think like, oh, that part doesn't really fit for me. But I, I realized recently just how much I do value efficiency over feelings and Mm -hmm. how I haven't really let myself be in tune with more of the subtle layers, right? Like it's easy to know like when the big feelings are coming, but the more subtle things that I really need to give space for, I'm 41 years old, just figuring that out now. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple of things. If you don't have wounding, which I I haven't really run into anybody that doesn't, (laughs) you know, people that hate their sensitivity tend to have wounding. And I find that either people are so into their emotions that they really have a hard time regulating their emotions. And so they learn to kind of, they, their healing is about learning how to have distress tolerance and manage their emotions mm-hmm. and kind of use more of their thinking brain. And for me, you know, I live from my neck up. And so like I intellectually, I excel, but then I've really had to learn how to slow the process down and to, to be yeah. with feelings and to sit with feelings. So depending mm-hmm. on what your experience was in childhood, we really want to try and get a balance between the two as, as much as we can. Right. And to be clear, I mean, what you experienced was trauma. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what all of us have experienced, like everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that, you know, on my podcast, I have some pretty significant attachment injuries and, you know, they Mm -hmm. still come up and like, I have some amazing Mm -hmm. relationships with other highly sensitive therapists. My attachment Mm -hmm. injuries still come up. I mean, today, before we started recording, I was telling you today is my 23rd wedding anniversary. It's a second marriage for both of us. I've got 20 year old twins. We've got a solid marriage. We have books for the family and on holidays, we write in everybody's books. I haven't written in my husband's book because like with the pandemic, with what's going on politically, Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm really tightly, tightly wrapped right now. And I have this sense if I were to slow down, I'm going to come unglued. And so I'm resisting getting in touch with that part of me that I want to tell my husband how much I care about him. But it's like, I call it my taskmaster. You know, I kind of picture mm. her with a, you know, little hat on and the clipboard and the pencil protector. And, you know, like, I'm just going to get shit done. Yeah. And that's what I do to survive. And so it's like, she needs to put the clipboard down and, and get a little bit of motion. Like, I just don't want to go there. And and, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm going to need to do it today. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the reality and I don't regret it, but I feel embarrassed as a therapist saying that. And it doesn't matter if we're therapists or not. We're still human beings that have human Absolutely. struggles on a daily basis. And and I really want to pull the curtain back on that because mm-hmm. we're just humans. Right, right. And to slow down and allow yourself to feel the feelings potentially means opening up some stuff that's going to take a little bit of time. And that's not efficient. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I have right? a very busy day today. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm realizing that too, that that's part of I need to slow down and I need to create more space so that I do have time to feel these feelings instead of I'm so good at just plowing through and then, you know, being exhausted at the end of the day and wondering why, why am I not feeling good? Why am I sad? Why am I anxious? Oh, because you haven't been able to like let yourself have the feelings move through. Yeah. Well, I've had a week filled with a lot of conflict, having to deal with some other people and some setting more boundaries, having to ask somebody Mm. to step down from a position. Mm. So I do go into my feelings and I can tolerate them. But when it comes to, I think the really, well, and with this big stuff that was going on, I shared it with two friends and said, like, if we use Marco Polo, an app that's, that I, you know, leave information and when they're ready, they leave it back. And on both of them, I said, like, if you want to get really pissed off on my behalf, I'd be okay with that. And yeah. one did and the other kind of glossed over it. And so I had to go in and say like, hey, this was a really big thing. And I, I feel like you really did not, mm-hmm. I, I don't feel like it was important in the way that you responded. Mm-hmm. And like that felt vulnerable. And mm-hmm. so having to sit with the discomfort and how that, you know, tags onto my attachment injuries. And then I had to walk, okay, so if that pisses her off and she doesn't, you know, respond, like that's okay, but I'm I'm seeing how much of my history is about having people not respond in healthy ways and people coming back at me. Right. And this isn't what happened. And I knew that this was a solid relationship and it still brings up that attachment injury that I had to sit with throughout the day. So it's been a high intensity week as far as doing really hard things and setting boundaries and getting clearer on the things. You know, I feel like I'm good at boundaries, but this was kind of like a whole new level of having to set boundaries and not not caretake people. So Mm -hmm. it's a workshop. (laughs) Good job. Thank you. Seriously. It's, you know, for, for someone who cares so much about what other people think and feel and like this desire for connection, I am completely relating to that boundaries thing too, right? Like I, I had an issue that came up with a staff member last night and I was talking to my husband about it. And I was like, first of all, I was like, okay, I'm feeling a feeling. And I need to talk about it. And then, of course, we went right into problem solving. And then I was like, no, 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 back up. Let me feel the feelings. And I had to remind myself, like, as a boss, it's not my job to make everybody happy. But then I have to tolerate the consequences (laughs) of that. And it's so fucking hard. Yeah, yeah. That was part of the realization that my brand is about being authentic. And I really see that I, I do value connection and I value peace. And it's worked for me to kind of go out of my way. And I Mm -hmm. had this person that was doing some work for me that just really was not in alignment with what my values were. And we had this call and they said some pretty, I think, insensitive and unkind things. And without realizing it, because there was conflict and I wanted to make sure that I could show that I could hear them, I didn't say things like, ow, did you just say that? Mm. Like, that really hurts. Yeah, That I kind of had my my therapist hat on, which... yeah. You know, so I I had to follow up with an email and that wasn't their preferred method of communication. I just had to kind of say like, you know, Mm -hmm. you said some things that didn't really feel very good. And we obviously Mm -hmm. have different feelings. And I had to say, I need you to step down from this position. And and what I'm realizing is not everybody's going to, I mean, I know this, but this is like on a new level. Like not everybody's going to agree with me. Not everybody's going to like me. And Mm -hmm. that I really need to be there and take care of myself. And like I do this on other levels. I don't know how to articulate, but like then, you know, you kind of have to level up and it's like now we're doing like master's level boundaries or something. Mm -hmm. Just getting into my next question, I was just thinking how COVID, at least for me, has really kind of opened a lot of these wounds and highlighted, like you said, the level up, like the next level, the next depth of healing work that needs to be done. You're shaking your head. So you're finding that too. Yeah. I I mean, I feel like it's pushing us. I feel like we're all pieces of coal that are going to be diamonds pretty soon because of the immense pressure that we don't have that relief and that bounce back that we normally do for that resilience. Mm -hmm. So everybody's on our fucking last nerve. Mm -hmm. And the the nice thing of COVID is, especially for someone that, you know, am I making a big deal out of this? Am I being dramatic? It's like, well, it's kind of a life or death thing that it's really giving us an opportunity to really speak our truth because the stakes are much higher, more than like, are you going to get mad at me? And am I going to hurt your feelings? It's like, No, this is how I have to take care of myself. So I think many of us are having conversations with loved ones with the political climate. You know, we've had to unfriend, unfollow. 
with Black right. Lives Matter. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really pushing everything to the surface and we're under a tremendous amount of pressure and stress. And like, we're just like, I don't have room for shit anymore. I just don't. And mm-hmm. I think that's true for many people. And I think it can be seen as a very positive thing. We don't have that room to play nice anymore. You know, that it's okay. I can absorb this. Like there's no room to absorb. Right. Yeah. My tolerance is shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just backing up a little bit. This question just popped in my head. When did you know you wanted to become a therapist? When somebody told me I'd be good at it. I have never, like when I was a kid, I wanted, this is, so I'm 57. So Merv Griffin, Dinah Shore, and Phil Donahue were the talk show hosts. Like I either wanted to be a talk show host, write a book, or be a ballet dancer. Ballet dancer was like not even really an option. (laughs) But even at that young age, like I knew that I wanted to be seen for me, for who I was, that that's really Mm -hmm. what those things were about. Mm -hmm. I Nobody ever talked to me about college. Nobody in my family went to college. Mm. I graduated. I went to junior college because I didn't know what else to do. They had sign language. Mm. I took it. I did great. I was a sign language interpreter. And somebody said to me, yeah, yeah. And then somebody said to me, I think you'd really like social work. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) Wow. I'm a late bloomer. I just kind of probably probably because of my sensitivity it took me 14 years to get my bachelor's degree I got married I got divorced I couldn't take a full load if I wasn't going to get an A or B I'd drop the class hmm. without knowing what it was I changed my major I've got two AA degrees you know my kids are in college now and one had to take a semester off one took a, a year off and it's like hey you got 14 years so take your time <laughs> My as long as you really... do it in 14, you're going to beat me. So we're good. <laughs> you know, and if they don't, that's okay. College that's isn't great. for everybody. My husband is not right. really happy with that 14-year uh, bachelor plan. But I think that we need to take the time that we need to take. And it mm-hmm. just kind of helped me. So I went into social work. And I think we are healers. We're healers and helpers. Mm-hmm. And and part of being an HSP, I think I have a tremendous amount of insight because I have so much of my own wounding and I've been in therapy for years. And I don't know about you, but m- my podcast will be two years in October and I have grown up so much since starting the yes. podcast. Yes. It has brought up so much stuff for me to heal and mm-hmm. to look at. And I use that as content for my bonus episodes. Mm-hmm. And, and I just think that we've got to be willing to do our own work. We just have to. And I kind of want to go on a tirade about people that don't, but I I don't think I want to go there. (laughs) (laughs) Therapists that don't do their work and are just judgy. I'm judgy, but I do my work. Right, right. Well, and that's something I'm really, really working on right now. Like one of the things, the themes that's come up with COVID is the desire to really live into interconnectedness and recognize that we are all one. And that's what's missing right now, right? Because we are so separate and so divided. And when I think about how judgmental I am at other people not doing their work, I I was listening to something last night and it was saying like, whenever you're, you know, pointing the finger at somebody else, there's, there's, all this work that you need to do for yourself and to remember that us doing our work individually does help the collective. And for me, being someone who feels things deeply and I have a lot of judgments, I used to feel bad for him and I don't. So like, here's an Mm -hmm. example that my husband and I, my mom has a dog. She lives with us. And so we walk her dog and her dog is very, very reactive to other dogs. We're, We're trying to work it out. I have this hierarchy in my mind about what trumps what, like a walker and a dog and a person with a dog, dog trumps the walker. Mm-hmm. Two dogs, a stroller. Like I have this whole hierarchy of who mm-hmm. I think should move. We bring masks. very efficient. <laughs> but nobody knows my rules and not everybody know, right? plays one. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be incredibly irritating. Right. You know, we always bring our masks with us. But my preference is to move off the sidewalk into the street as opposed mm-hmm. to putting my mask on. You know, put a good 12 feet between us and mm-hmm. that works. Yep. And I find myself getting really irritated when somebody with a dog comes onto a street that we're walking on and then we have to move or somebody that is just Mm -hmm. one person doesn't move. Like I get really irritated and I just have to know not everybody is playing by the same rules that I am and that Mm -hmm. in order to take care of myself, I don't wait to play chicken and see who's going to move because that just agitates me. I'm just going to go out in the street, cross the street and move, Mm -hmm. but I'm entitled to be angry and irritated about it and I'm not going to feel bad about it. Mm-hmm. And it's just what it is. And so there are lots of situations where I, I, I may not, it may not be appropriate in the relationship. If you do something that, you know, irritates the hell out of me, I may go to somebody close and say, you know, Sarah does this thing that just drives me batshit crazy. Do I need to say something to her? Is this my stuff? Mm-hmm. I can own that mm-hmm. and then figure out 
is this something to bring to you or not? Right. But I'm not going to feel bad about what comes up. And it's not always appropriate for me to process that with you, but I need a place to have right. that. You know, emotions are just energy. Yes, absolutely. And for people that feel things deeply to tell us to not do that or that's gossipy or it's not letting mm-hmm. go of things, I think is an incredible disservice. There's a difference between like mm-hmm. Sarah, blah, 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 Sarah, blah, 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 or yes. this thing is coming up and I don't know what to do with it. And I find that I get activated and like she says this and I feel like she's criticizing me and it brings up that narrative of no matter what I do, it's not okay. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just trying to work it out. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And I, I love that you make the distinct recognition that sometimes it's not about processing it with the person, right? That's a big mistake that I made a lot in my (laughs) 20s and most of my 30s too, like thinking that I need some sort of resolution between the two of us rather than, yes, this is, and even even if it's their stuff, that doesn't mean I need to process it with them. Right, Right, right. I think there's this process of when we're young, you know, we feel like we can't say anything and so we don't. Mm -hmm. And then we learn that we can and then we have to tell everybody everything that's going on because we can and we, you know, we say no to everybody because now we have boundaries. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a little little slingshot. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. what I'm finding now is that, you know, even with relationships that oftentimes instead of confronting a relationship, sometimes we just need to let it go and, you know, Mm -hmm. we do what we need to do and then we come back and oftentimes having to confront people in relationships kind of ends a relationship where we just, it might be a season where it needs to go into hibernation. Mm-hmm. But if you would have told me that in my past, I, you know, I'm like, no, I got to tell everybody everything that I'm feeling. <laughs> right. Well, there's discernment, right? And I think that does come with wisdom of maybe age and experience and all that. But right, there is a fine line between speaking our truth and owning our truth and and creating drama. Yeah. And I think there's a way to, that I can stand in my truth without having to tell you why you're not in my truth. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it takes a while to get there. Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. don't always stay there. Right. Right. <laughs> and it's not a destination, right? It's a moment to moment and depends on the relationship, depends on the trigger. All these sorts of variables make a difference. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. One concept that I've been thinking about lately that I Googled and not a lot of information comes up, but it came up in terms of like being an empath and highly sensitive person is unmanaged empathy. Mm -hmm. Is that a term that you can speak on? I haven't heard that before. I know when COVID started, I was using the term empathy overload that, you know, even Back in March, when we were looking at what was going to happen to schools, I was, you know, my kids Mm -hmm. were grown there in college. And so I don't have to send kids back to school, but I was really worried about like, what about the parents that work and that have kids and how are they going to manage? And it's like, that does like, that's, there's nobody in my life that that fits. And I was really feeling a lot of pain. And I think that it's Mm. very easy for us to have empathy. I, I think too, that just collectively what's going on in the world right now can be really hard. Because Mm -hmm. it's hard to just not absorb some of that. My understanding of an empath is that I can't tell what's mine and yours. That if you're angry, then Mm -hmm. I get angry. If you're sad, I get sad. This is my imprecise definition. But as a highly sensitive person, I'm going to have empathy for what's going on for you. But I may not. I may be impacted by it. I mean, like when my kid would have a tantrum and he'd slam the door, it brought out my inner teenager and I wanted to have a tantrum. I don't see that as being an empath. It's like it activated my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And if if I have clients that cry, I often get tearful because I'm feeling Mm -hmm. empathic, but I don't feel like I'm taking on their stuff. So I think that there are ways that we can manage. I mean, we're going to be impacted when we have relationships with people. We want to have that. Mm -hmm. Is a highly sensitive person different from an empath? My understanding is that some HSPs are empaths, some empaths are HSPs. I've heard that on the continuum, empaths are beyond HSPs. I tend to follow Dr. Erin and the people that follow her as far as how they feel about empaths. There are lots of other people. So I I don't feel like I can speak with much, you know, like Mm -hmm. I follow what Dr. Erin says. So really the simple answer is, I don't know. Damn if I know. (laughs) Okay. Interesting. I'll have to look up the, I'll have to look up the hierarchy or the, the spectrum of that. I think it depends on who you look at. I mean, Judith Orloff mm-hmm. has done a lot on empaths, but I don't know that there is a definitive way of looking at it. I think it depends on mm-hmm. who you talk to. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Cool. 
One of the pieces of information I, I just want to go back to that I didn't say, and yeah. I, I may not be as articulate in this. So in Dr. Aaron's original research, what she said is being an HSP equally affects men and women 50-50. I don't know that there's been any research done on how that affects people that are non-binary, if people mm. fall somewhere else on the gender spectrum. But mm-hmm. it's often assumed that this affects women more than men. And, and for the mm. few men that I have in my group, they often say it's really challenging being a highly sensitive male. I mean, mm-hmm. it's hard being a woman. We don't want to be labeled as hysterical, which we usually are. Right. But I think it's even harder for men. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's slide into the healer talk. Okay. Because you, 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 you kind of already told us that you, you consider yourself a healer, but say more. What do you think? Well... Really, my mission with the work that I'm doing, I do therapy and I do coaching. I teach an online course for HSPs. And really, my mission for my podcast is I want people to know that they're not alone and that there's not anything wrong with them and Mm -hmm. that our perceived weaknesses are really our superpowers. And I really believe that for every negative that we're told about our trait, that we have a corresponding strength and really learning to lean into that and to change the Mm -hmm. narrative around what we've been told. It still comes up for me. I mean, Mm -hmm. and it's interesting. My son was just down the other day and we were talking. And again, like I said, I have this narrative that, you know, my husband's the fun parent and I'm not. And there's some truth to that. I have two kids. They each have girlfriends. And my son was saying how much, you know, his girlfriend and my other son's girlfriend, like they love being with Steve because he can talk to anybody about anything. And he really can. He has this amazing ability. And this conversation has been running around in my head. And what I have to remind myself is, Out of all of them, I'm the only one that's wired like me. And so I have Mm -hmm. my places where I get my needs met. And of course, I want to be the popular fun mom, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And if something happens, I'm the one that the kids will call, and I have to be okay with that. But it would be Mm -hmm. easy for me to run a real damaging narrative around that. And and I kind of perpetuate it with my, you know, my husband's the fun dad, but he kind of is. Mm How did you make that shift for yourself from judging these parts of yourself to embracing them? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I, you know, using mindfulness and naming things, I think is the, is one of the most powerful things of just naming what's going on. And I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with my husband because I totally compare like on Father's Day, this son called my husband. And then on Mother's Day, my husband said, Oh, I think he's going to call you. And he texted me. And I'm like, like, I just get the text and mm-hmm. he gets the phone call. Mm-hmm. And I did it on my birthday that he mm-hmm. didn't get me a gift. He, oh, so, Okay, so here's my bias. My husband asked both of the boys to write 10 things that they appreciated about me. And I got that. Mm. And I didn't get a gift. And they got my husband a gift. So I go mm-hmm. into this comparing. Mm-hmm. Like, I just do. And so I, yeah. I had to talk about it. I had to say I was hurt and then figure out how to not bring that into the relationship with them right. and try and sort through do I need to say something? Is this about the gift? Is this about being thought mm-hmm. of and, and having to process through it? But allowing myself to feel mm-hmm. angry, jealous, hurt, upset, not take it out on my kids, not bring it to them, you know, take right. it somewhere safe to process it until I wasn't ha- being so emotional before I could address it with them, which is pretty much the process that I try and bring to most things and really embrace them. Like, it's okay to be jealous. It's okay to compare. Right. Like, it doesn't help, but I'm going to do it. So to tell me to mm-hmm. stop it isn't really going to be very helpful. It's just going to make me feel like now I'm really doing something wrong because mm-hmm. I'm comparing. Hmm. Well, and in that too, I also hear a sense of scarcity, a sense of not enough, like there's not enough love, right? Y- your husband's yeah. getting more love than you're getting and there's not enough for you then. Yeah, yeah. It's that comparison thing that like I just heard what you said, but it's like, well, how come he gets it and I don't? And you know, the what about right. me? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And then what's the, I guess, message to yourself underneath that? Probably that I don't matter. I mean, that's yeah. one of my big things that, you know, yeah. I don't matter. I'm not important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Deep shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we all have it. Yay. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mine is always not good enough. And it's so interesting to me how even though I don't matter and I'm not good enough, a lot of people would be like, same thing very Mm -hmm. different. (laughs) It's very, very different. And I found it so interesting, you know, asking questions about being a healer and and a wounded healer, asking them over and over the very fine nuances that come with the way that we understand words. And I'm so curious about why in particular those words, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Have you seen any themes of what people's core wounds are? You know, some some interviews we get into that and some we don't. So if if I were to like do some sort of research project, I probably would ask people to get a little bit deeper and, and be able to suss some of those things out. Actually, that might be a really fun project. No, Sarah, no more work. Stop it. <laughs> so he's slapping myself on the hand. Every time I have an idea, I'm like, oh, let's create a new business. No, let's yeah. not do that. <laughs> yeah. I also worry, like, I don't know how, how deep to go with somebody, like, in an interview. Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to activate anything that's going to be too mm-hmm. much. So I always feel like, uh, how, mu- mm-hmm. how much do you really want? You're like, how deep do you want to go? Do mm-hmm. you have that also? You know, I am probably m- more likely to kind of poke poke at things, poke around mm-hmm. it and see if people will come out. And most of the time they do. I think mm. I get the feedback that I create a really safe space and that it ends up feeling like, oh, we're just talking on the phone or something like that. Like yeah. forgetting that this is going to be out to, you know, however many people are going to listen. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of messages about, I was too nosy. I asked too many personal questions. This is before I was a therapist. And oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I've, <laughs> I've, in, I've internalized that, that I think I often feel like, in a therapy session, I definitely will go there, but I feel like outside of that, I think I still have that negative thing of like, oh, don't, don't be too nosy. Like, mm. I'm so curious and fascinated about things. I really am. Right. And when I started my podcast, there were some pretty primary people in the field that I wanted to ask to be on. And my mission is I want people to be authentic and vulnerable and talk about their struggles mm-hmm. as well as the things that work. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many people turn me down Yeah, because that's mm-hmm. not what their brand is. Exactly. I I actually have had that as well. There are some people that I just love their work and respect it so much. And I said, hey, are you willing to talk about your process? And they say, no, I just want to talk about my work. And I'm like, mom, that's not really what we do in the podcast. I mean, we do some, but we're talking about us meeting soul to soul here. And I don't know about you, but I've had more people reach out and say, like, you're in my head. How did you get in my head? And I Mm -hmm. love the work you're doing. And it's been Mm -hmm. transformational. And thank you for sharing your struggles. Like, Yes. You just show me how to go through it. And I don't feel like there's anything wrong, which is why mm-hmm. when things I'm struggling with, I sit down and I record because I know I'm not the only one. Right, right. How, I guess, what's the level of fear that comes with that vulnerability of exposure? Because I, there are different episodes that I've had fear about releasing. And sometimes it goes all the way up to a 10, like this fear of like, holy shit, like, my colleagues are going to think I'm crazy and, you know, I'll never get this job because of this or, you know, what, whatever story I'm making up. Do you have that as well? Oh, yeah. It was worse in the beginning. And I would often have yeah. a therapist friend listen to an episode before mm-hmm. I released it. Mm-hmm. I've had people listen when I, because I'm the most creative when I'm upset is when I'm passionate. Mm-hmm. And if I wait until the situation settles down, I'm like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But if I sit down and record in the moment, I really have this ability to be incredibly gifted and articulate about what I'm feeling. And I was mm-hmm. in this paid mastermind with other podcasters and a podcaster that I had admired, really, really admired and looked up to. And I gave some feedback about the mastermind and what was not working. Hmm. And I woke up one morning and a colleague of mine said, you dropped the mastermind. I'm like, no. (gasps) And then I looked at, yeah. Oh yeah. You got kicked out? (laughs) Then I read my email and the podcaster of the mastermind had decided I wasn't a good fit for the group. And this was like a year long mastermind. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know how many feelings that brought up for me? Oh my God. You know, it it activated like, Mm. here's another time when another, a man has made a decision that, you know, something's Mm. not going to work for me without Mm -hmm. having the courtesy of talking about it with me. No problem solving, no nothing. Like I've just decided. So I recorded Mm. three episodes and then I went through this thing of, and I didn't say who it was. I Mm -hmm. I didn't give any information, but I went through this thing Mm -hmm. of like, I'm going to be sued. I'm going to be sued. Mm-hmm. And then the third mm-hmm. the third episode in this series was, you know, regrets about mm-hmm. it. And I said, you know, if you're listening to this, you may not find the previous two episodes because I don't know that it was okay. And one of my closest friends, I, I always sense something from her. She's a therapist. I sense something and I couldn't figure out what it was that she would not share the way that I do. Mm-hmm. And I was sensing something from her and it, and it felt like disapproval in it because she just wouldn't talk about the things that I do. And I mm-hmm. feel like, we need to have these conversations. How are we ever going to grow and heal if nobody's willing to model yeah. what we're doing? I don't throw people under the bus. I don't name them. I say my intention for sharing is I'm struggling and I'm trying to figure mm-hmm. out what I need to do with this. I'm very clear with my intention. And it's interesting that somebody wrote to me after that regrets and said, 
she actually named me Mad Lady Balls. I didn't I didn't know Mad Lady oh, Balls yeah, was I even saw a your thing. Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She said, please don't delete it. This has mm-hmm. been so healing for me. It's changed my life. You're so mm-hmm. courageous. So, you know, this sense of vulnerability and should I do it? And then somebody going like, you're showing me how to be brave. Yeah. But yeah, any anytime it's something new, I like, should I? Is this too much? Yeah. Am I going to regret it? Yeah, that's, you know, now that you speak to it that way, that that is a piece of feedback that I often get is that, you know, oh, well, you are so vulnerable, like that, you know, you're a model for X, Y, Z. My response is often like, well, this is just kind of how I am. I, I feel like to silence myself is not organic and authentic. And so this is just kind of how I move through the world. And so I'm glad that it's helpful for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that the world is craving authenticity and realness. Mm-hmm. Brene Brown says we're wired for connection. Mm. We want to be seen and heard, especially if you're someone that's been told that how you show up at the world is not okay. Mm-hmm. Just having somebody be witness to our process for our ability to name what's going on. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I feel inadequate. And for somebody to go, I hear you. Man, that is so healing. That is so mm-hmm. healing. Absolutely. And for me, it's also being seen. And again, this is the nuance of that, right? Like I'm a singer, I'm a performer. So you would think being heard is the one that kind of drops in, but it's being seen. And so it's not probably an accident. Like I didn't consciously think I want to be seen. So I'm going to cover myself in tattoos and have a mohawk and da da da. That's not how it came to be. But that was kind of a product of this just desire to be seen authentically because I was basically just a mirror for my parents growing up. And that was so painful. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I think that can be really, you know, what I call gremlins that every time we mm-hmm. step out and allow ourselves to be seen can mm-hmm. be so terrifying because those gremlins just want to put us back in the box and get us to conform. And the, the more mm-hmm. our gremlins are up, who are you? Who do you think you are? You can't be doing this. You don't know anything. The louder that is, the more we're really kind of stepping into ourselves and owning Mm-hmm. who we are, that there's so much healing in that. And and it's not a linear process. You know, you're in the box, you're out of the mm-hmm. box, you're in the box, you're out of the box. <laughs> right, right. You know, and just thinking about kind of going back to like the idea of interconnectedness and I'm doing this like spiritual course and it's talking about the programming that we receive from society. And, and there is like, I feel like the voices right now are so loud because as a collective, we're really disconnected from the source that gives us life and energy and healing and happiness. And so the voices that are going to criticize are going to be so loud externally and internally, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, this is a crazy ass time that we're living in. And I, and unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I think that we're going to see more crazy ass shit than 2020. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I stopped saying like, I can't believe this or what else. I I just stopped saying that because every day I'm like, I can't believe it. Yeah. How can you make that shit up? Right. <laughs> but that's going to create distress for us, unrest. You know, it's like children having parents that are constantly fighting and nobody's on the same page. And during this whole mm-hmm. pandemic, what we needed mm-hmm. was somebody to go, hey, kids, hey, people, hey, hey, people of the United States, this is really hard stuff. We've got a plan. This is what we're doing. And we haven't got that. It's them. It's them. They, you know, I'm doing the right. best job I can. How Mm -hmm. can we have any, there's like, there's no end in sight. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's creating a tremendous amount of anxiety and depression Mm -hmm. and stress because who the fuck is in charge? Right. Yep. Cheeto. (laughs) (laughs) I think my listeners are on the same page with that. If they're not, well, you know where you're coming. (laughs) I have a couple of conservative clients and they're like, I I know what I'm in for. It's fine. (laughs) I haven't had the guts to get too political. I've gotten a little bit, but Mm -hmm. not on my podcast. And Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to rectify that because my niche is highly sensitive people. So do I want to weed out all of the people that are conservative? Like, I I don't know. I don't know if I have enough mad lady balls for that yet. Yeah. You know, it's a really hard decision. And when things went down with George Floyd, I recognized how important it was for me to share what I've been learning in terms of anti racism and. I find like politics and racism and that kind of stuff that's like, quote unquote, impolite to talk about in mixed company. That's how we perpetuate it. 
So I decided for myself, I am going to bring it into the light and I'm going to keep talking about it. And it's going to piss people off. Like whenever I do presentations, I'm putting anti-racism stuff in there and I've gotten negative feedback. And I'm like, well, I know I'm on the right side of history in terms of anti-racism. So I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, no. And I did the same thing. And then just Mm -hmm. trying to figure out, like trying to go back to what is my purpose and intention and how do I do this mindfully and incorporate what's important. And I find too that like, I just kind of want to go with whatever I'm feeling. I'm feeling this and those are the people I want to interview. And if I'm feeling that, Mm -hmm. and that's just kind of how I ride. I I keep having the sense that I should be more linear and more not like me, but it's just not how I am. So yeah. 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 I hear it. Well, we're coming close to the end, but I want to make sure we talk about wounded healer. I want to hear your thoughts on that term. I think that so many of us that go into the healing professions do it because of our wounding, whether it's conscious or not. And the healers that don't look at their wounding scare the fucking shit out of me because, uh, you know, those are the people. And I worked in the medical field. I saw a lot of nurses too that can be incredibly Mm. codependent and controlling, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, show me what the rule is, show me, you know, everything is external. And I think when we have the courage to really dig deep, if we have people that can really help us do that to embrace the shadow side, the dark side, the things that we're not supposed to, quote, not supposed to look at. And mm-hmm. we start to to be okay with that, be okay with all of our feelings, all the things that come up. It is so powerful. And as we're willing to dig into our stuff, we model that to our clients. And the more work yep. we do, the more safety we create for our clients. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I tell my clients on the first session, like, I'm going to screw up. And so how are you going to be able to tell me, you know, can you tell me in this session, can you send me an email afterwards? Because if we can't do that work between us, right? that's where the healing comes from. And for me to go like, I don't have all the answers. I'll tell you during this pandemic, I've had clients like they're explaining or describing exactly what I'm going through. And they're asking me for, you know, what do you do? And I'm thinking, fuck if I know. (laughs) (laughs) Yup. Yup. Big old shrug. Mm-hmm. And it's it's brought so much intimacy because we are all going mm-hmm. through something similar. We may be experiencing it differently right now, but we're all feeling this pressure. And it has created such a level of intimacy to talk about how hard it is and the struggles. I, I just see these posts about like when your clients ask how you are, do you tell them? It's like during the pandemic, of course I tell them. It's of hard. Right. It's fucking hard. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask my clients, how is that hearing that? And they say, it just feels Mm -hmm. like it's so relieving and to know that they're not alone. So for me to pretend like I've got my shit together, that, Mm -hmm. I I mean, I honestly think that that can be abusive. It's crazy making. It's gaslighting. It's crazy making. Yeah. I, I actually just took a month off from seeing clients so I could focus on taking care of myself because I was at my wits end. And it was interesting, the variety of responses that I got. You know, some people were like, well, I'm jealous. I want to take that time off, you know. And then there was one client where she was like, oh, well, that makes sense because you actually hurt me when you said this one thing. And I was like, mm. well, Jesus Christ, another thing to beat myself up about. But like you said, we were able to work through it. And the thing that made me feel so good at the end of the day is she said, I knew I could tell you. And we could have an honest conversation about it instead of you getting defensive or, or whatever. But then I took that to supervision and got to work on it on my own. But how we show up in the therapy relationship is so crucial. Yeah. And I wish one of my therapists, one of the many therapists would have shared that. I just kept thinking like something was wrong with me. How come I still struggled mm. with this stuff? How come? I mean, I still struggle mm-hmm. with food and eating and using, especially during the pandemic, using food for comfort. Oh, right. And I see these graphics and memes of like, if you're struggling with sleep or eating or this or that, you know, you might, it's like, we're in a pandemic. You're going to tell me that the people that have it together are the people that mm-hmm. use control as a way to manage their anxiety. Right. I'm not saying, I think that we can all be functioning and we're all struggling on some level, whether mm-hmm. people acknowledge it or not. And like, let's just get fucking real about that. Mm-hmm. And when I have clients that come to me, it's like, you're not going to, you're not going to lose these traits, but what's going to happen is you're going to learn to when they happen and you go like, oh, right. it's that thing again. Now, what do I need to do? And you learn to manage and the volume gets turned down and, mm-hmm. you know, you lean into it as opposed to not having those traits. That right. to me is so much more helpful. And I wish somebody would have told that to me. It's, it's okay to struggle. Right. We're supposed to struggle. We're humans. Right, right. We're complicated. We're messy. 
Yeah. And that is my hope with therapists who listen to this podcast is the recognition that like you don't have to have all your shit together and be perfect before you go into this field because it's a constant movement, a constant change and shift and evolution. Yeah. Like you said, like I've grown up with this podcast too. It's two and a half years now for me. And and yeah, I've I think about some of the first episodes and go a little bit like, oh, like, did I have to do it that way? Because you're just learning as we go. Yeah. You know, and I was thinking when your client told you that she had feelings about you taking time off, my first thought was you did something right that she felt safe enough to come to you. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we needed as kids to go, I'm mad. I don't like this. To have our voices be heard and we get a chance to model. And I tell clients, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to withdraw. I'm not going to punish you. We need that safety and that we don't have, there There often are not very many places where people have that experience. And how can they know to expect that in relationships if we can't model that for them? Yeah. We can't open up those dialogues and allow our clients to get pissed off at us or frustrated or disappointed or hurt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to make sure to share with listeners today? I want to talk to you all day because this is fun. Because <laughs> well, I like you. <laughs> Let's do Marco Polo. I didn't realize you were on the polo. I am. Do that. I yeah. am on the polo. I would love Because the whole that. asynchronous thing, that makes life so much easier. Yeah. Isn't it great? Yes. Isn't it great? Yeah. It's fabulous. Well, tell yeah. people where they can find you before we wrap up. The best place is unapologeticallysensitive.com. I've got a YouTube channel. I've got Instagram. You can find all of my handles there. I do run an online HSP course. We talk about boundaries and perfectionism and self-care and how to create a lifestyle that honors the HSP. So if you want to know more about being an HSP, I've got some videos on my website. I'm just really passionate about like we're really fine the way that we are. We just need to kind of work through some stuff to really see what those strengths are and have those amazing connections. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Patricia, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's really been, it's been a fun conversation. I like this. I'm not surprised. It's my COVID treat for today. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much to Patricia for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Patricia and her podcast, Unapologetically Sensitive, you can visit us at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks as always to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Thanks to you two for tuning in. Until next time. Bye-bye. Hey again. So what'd you think? If you stayed, you must be okay with having a potty mouth. I love to swear. I... I often feel like I'm very disingenuous because if you work with me individually or you work in the groups that I do, I swear. So it's very confusing. And it's just the way that it worked out. If you're interested in taking the online HSP course, I'm not sure if you're going to hear this in time for the new ones that are launching, but they are incredibly powerful. If you want to hear episodes of people that have taken the course, I have some on my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you go to the HSP groups page, these groups are just pretty amazing. I happen to love running groups. Not everybody loves running groups. I think people think of groups, especially as an HSP, and we cringe. These are small, intimate groups. I don't take any more than eight people per group. They're often smaller than that. Everybody has a chance to share. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I think the power of being with other people that are wired like you, it's just been so healing. And as a couple of guests have said on different podcasts who've taken the course, and I've had a number of therapists take the course as well, that even when you work with a therapist, they tell you that there's nothing wrong with you, but there's something that's really different when you're in a group of people that are wired similarly to you are. And you get to see the things in yourself that feel yucky and you see it in someone else and you have tremendous compassion. And then we talk about that or the things that we feel like are wrong with ourselves and we get a reality check and people go, God, I love when you talk about things. It makes me feel connected and close to you. It's just really healing. And I I think often as HSPs, we tend to do a lot of intellectual work, but it's the experiential work and how we often do some of our really powerful healing is in relation to others. And because the groups are set up in a very safe and structured way, I'm really good at holding boundaries and creating safety. As I share with you in the podcast, in the group, whatever's going on with me that week, I share, we incorporate 
whatever's going on to fit the topic. But if people have other things that are going on, there's room for people to talk about it. And the connection that I see forming, I can't guarantee it happens all the time, but the connections that I've seen that have formed are really valuable. And this year has been so dysregulating and so chaotic and so unprecedented. I think we're really hungry for connection and authenticity and meaning and that sense of connection. If you're interested, I would love to have you in the course, if not this round. I should be running them again during the year. We're just going to have to see how it goes. There's a lot going on for me right now, so I'm trying to figure out what I can manage. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. Not sure if you're going to hear this at the end of the year, the beginning of the new year. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're managing. We can do hard things. It's really been a roller coaster ride. I appreciate each and every one of you. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 